Welcome. I'm Colleen Jennings Rogensock, Vice President of Cultural Affairs at Arizona State University and Executive Director of ASU Gamage. And it's my pleasure to moderate live streaming a conversation, How Did We Get Here? The History and Future of International Presenting the U.S. Perspective. First of all, I want to thank HowlAround for their commitment to this work. The International Presenting Commons is a group that is dedicated to international presenting, particularly at this time when we are suffering through two pandemics, the pandemic of COVID-19 and the pandemic of systemic racism. Given the last previous four years of the White House administration, international touring has taken a back seat. While we remain very much committed to our American artists, we also know and value the importance of international presenting. This is but one of several conversations we will be having because this is a conversation about the history of how we got here and the future of where we're going. You will meet today a panelist of distinguished presenters and producers who have not only made a career of working in terms of international touring, but have also educated many of us along the way. They will each be representing the portions of the country where the bulk of their work has taken place. First, I would like to introduce Baraka Sele, and Baraka defines herself as a cultural warrior and a revolutionary. Baraka will be focusing on the continent of Africa. Next, I would like to introduce Christina Miranda King. Christina will be focusing on Mexico and Puerto Rico. She is based in Mexico City, raised in DC, She's a transnational consultant, producer, and curator of performing arts and music events. And she's the co-director and founder of a whole day travel and cultural experiences. Our next panelist will be Joe Melillo. We'll be focusing on Europe. Joe is the executive producer emeritus of Brooklyn Academy of Music, BAM. And after 35 years of experience, he completed his full-time work at BAM on January, 2019, and he's maintaining an advisory position to date at BAM. Our next panelist, Olga Garay English, her focus will be Latin America and the Caribbean, and also as a former funder of cultural exchanges. Olga Garay English is an independent arts consultant. Previously, she was the founding program director for the arts of Doris Duke Charitable Foundation and the executive director of the City of Los Angeles Department of Affairs, of Cultural Affairs. Also on our panel, you'll be hearing from Philip Arnaud, who will be focusing on his work in Eastern Europe. He founded the Theater Project in 1971 and the Center for International Theater Development in 1991. And Philip has done decade-long projects in East Africa and the Netherlands. His work is in Central and Eastern Europe, and he has began that work 45 years ago and continues to today. And our last panelist will be Rachel Cooper. Her focus will be Asia. Rachel Cooper has been at the Asia Society for over 25 years and has worked with performing artists in Asia and the US as a producer, presenter, researcher, and advocate, and is a proud member of our large arts ecosystem. Each of our panelists will speak for seven to eight minutes, and then our responders will respond to the panelists' comments. These two are individuals who have had a long history in international and global exchange. Our first responder will be John Kalaki, who worked with Trisha Brown, PepsiCo Summer Fair, Walker Arts Center, Yorba Buena Center, and the film, the Flynn Center, as well as the Pew Charitable Trust and the San Francisco Foundation Charitable Trust. He has now serving, is serving his second term in the Vermont House of Representatives. Your Honor, we're glad to have you here. Our next responder will be Linda Bromberg, she founded Pomegranate Arts in 1998, an independent production company dedicated to the development and touring of international performing arts project. And our next responder will be Claudia Norman, an independent creative producer based in New York City. She is the founder and director of Mexico Now Festival, producer of multicultural festivals in the US and Latin America, and recently co-founder of The New Generators, a new arts and entertainment company dedicated to create and produce programs with a global perspective. She's also a proud member of CIPA and a member of the Mexico Committee at NAPAMA. 
And our last responder will be David White, former artistic director of the Yard, executive director of Dance Theater Workshop, creator of the National Performance Network and Suitcase Fund. Each of the responders will have four minutes to respond and then we will open up our question and answers as soon as they are done. So we'd like to go ahead and begin. Our two questions we are asking of each panelist are this. What is your value prop proposition as it relates to international presenting? Please examine your practice and share one story about how your practice opened doors or enlightened audiences. And you must understand each of these individuals not only could spend the next two hours talking about their practice and the importance it has played for us in this country as well as globally. So confining it to eight minutes is going to be a challenge. So we'd like to first start off and kick it off with Baraka Sele. Baraka will have a picture up as we have some internet uh, connectivity things going on. Baraka? Well, thank you, Colleen. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, so first of all, I want to thank Colleen for inviting me to participate. I want to, of course, thank International Presenting Commons um, for this opportunity and making this conversation possible. I also want to thank my fellow panelists, and I would even say esteemed panelists, many of whom I've known for decades and even traveled with them to different parts of the world, including Africa, Asia, South America, I want to give a special shout out to Olga Garay. Uh, during her tenure at Doris Duke, she made it possible for presenters um, to not only meet artists and other presenters, but our peers around the world and to engage in their work. I also would just like to acknowledge a person who could not be with us that Colleen invited, and that is Christopher Hunt. For those of you who have been in the field as long as we have, some of you may know his name. And unfortunately, he's very ill in living in France and could not be with us. I want to be clear that when we say I'm talking about or representing Africa, I do not speak for Africa. I do not represent Africa. I can only represent and speak for my own experience, both personal and professional. And I could be wrong, but I think my experience was probably a bit different than my colleagues on this panel. If I can give you just a couple of examples, in the 1980s, I was working at the Houston International Festival. It was a festival that focused on the culture of a different country or region each year. And when we started having the conversation about Africa, one of the board members said, what if we send you to Africa, Baraka, and all you find is a bunch of jungle dancers? And then she was shocked when the only black board member got up and walked out. In the 1990s, while working at Yerba Buena Center for the Arts, at a reception, a woman said to me, how does a black woman get a job like this? In the early 21st century, Stephanie Hewley and I, were one of my uh, colleagues, were, um, were working with the National Song and Dance Company of Mozambique, and someone asked, why are you spending so much time on little third world dance companies? Of course, until that little third world dance company ended up on the front page of the New York Times art and cultural section. So this, these misperceptions that we have about Africa are very critical and a reason why I've been doing this work for over three decades. In 1995, when Mickey Shepard and Stephanie Hewley invited me to come to New York, I was still in San Francisco, to discuss a possible project of cultural exchange among artists of the African continent and their peers in the U.S., um, I was too eager and too excited. Let me just remind you that this was at a time when there was no widespread use of the Internet. People were communicating by email and fax, mach fax machines. And if you were working internationally, it was either FedEx or DHL. So most people's knowledge of Africa 
came from TV, meaning Tarzan, or the National Geographic, pictures of women with exposed breasts, or movies about the great white hunter, like Hemingway and Teddy Roosevelt. Very few folks knew the reality of Africa. So Mickey Shepard, Baraka Saleh, Stephanie Hewley, Laura Greer, Linda Walton, we crafted and designed a program funded by the Ford Foundation that we hoped would debunk some of the myths, inaccuracies, and outright lies about the African continent, Um, specifically its art and culture. So we were very much interested in both contemporary and traditional art and artists of Africa, especially after an official at the NEA told me that Africa does not have contemporary art. So just to give you an idea of and a few examples of the projects we worked on, Alonzo King with Lines Ballet worked with the Baca people of the Central African Republic. And the Baca came, he actually sailed down the Congo and went and met with them, and some of them came and toured here in the United States as well. And Ronald K. Brown worked with Rakia Kone, choreographer from the Ivory Coast, and her company also came here. Urban Bushwomen worked with that little third world dance company, the National Song and Dance Company of Mozambique. Again, these are just a few examples. So communities and cultures throughout the U.S. were able to engage with artists intimately with Africa and its artists. Yes, there were challenges. Yes, there were difficulties, especially visas, cultural context, language translation, especially with technical terms, disparities regarding compensation. For example, a major uh, art institution that will remain unnamed Uh, When we were talking about working together and collaborating with an African artist, they inquired, well, we're not going to pay the same to the African artist that we would pay to the U.S. artist, are we? And I inquired, why wouldn't we? And they said, because, well, those Africans aren't used to receiving and handling that kind of money. There were also, in addition to the challenges and difficulties, misunderstandings, and missteps. Suleiman Kohli from Ensemble Kotiba in the Ivory Coast said, I don't need to work with American artists. What I need is a piano. But in addition to these missteps and misunderstandings or challenges, there were also incredible rewards. We created an international advisory committee, um, a network of artists, presenters, scholars, humanities, and subject matter experts. Some of those relationships continue today. Some of those folks, including Colleen and Joe Melillo, are were on those panels and part of the um, International Advisory Committee. As mentioned, um, some of the things that happened were commissioning and presenting and touring new work, There were two international conferences regarding cultural exchange in Africa and the USA. I want to conclude with a point that I feel is very important. I've worked throughout the United States, in Detroit, in Atlanta, in Houston, in San Francisco, in New York, and in New Jersey. And in each of those locations, I've always been challenged by artists of so-called local communities. And I just would like to emphasize that first and foremost, I teach, I preach, I advocate that all artists are international artists. For me, international presenting is not synonymous with importing artists from other countries. International presenting is positioning all artists within a global curatorial context and framework that requires the same level of representation, consideration, compensation, opportunity, and respect. 
part of my mantra and methodology throughout the beginning of my work since I first went to Africa is read, research, study. Read, research, study. So I do have resources um, about current and historical presenting regarding working with Africa and the African diaspora. If you would like to receive those resources, you can um, perhaps in the Q&A uh, ask for my email, and I will give my email address. Thank you. Thank you, Baraka. That was wonderful. And two things. One, if you have questions as our, con our panelists are speaking and our responders are speaking, please put them in the chat. Also, know that each of these panelists as well as the responders have written a two page paper, which we're going to work with HowlAround and with APAP, the Association of Performing Arts Professionals and ISPA to have those papers ready for you to look at sometime this summer. So next, I would it's my pleasure to introduce Christina Miranda King. Hi, Colleen, can you, can you hear me? Thank you so much. I can hear you. Uh, your video doesn't appear to be on, Christina. Right, I'm uh, trying, probably not gonna do the video right now because I'm having some internet connections. Great, so all right, thank you. I'll go sans, sans video. But um, I also just really wanna thank you, Colleen, for bringing us together, uh, colleagues that I haven't seen in a, in a long time. Um, and I'm, I'm very excited, I'm very excited about being able to share some time with you and talk a little bit about Mexico and, uh, and, and, and my work and my perspectives. And I'm gonna kind of repeat what Baraka said. Again, I'm, I'm not representing the entire 32 states and 101 million. Mexico is a huge place and it's extremely diverse. And so I'm really going to talk about kind of a bit about what I encountered and why I wanted to go to Mexico from uh, Washington Performing Arts Society where I had been working as a director of Latino programming, which is really a title at that time in the, in the 90s that said everything and said nothing. Because, you know, director of Latino programming, I was being asked all the time, well, what do you think about, you know, Colombian contemporary dance or, or uh, traditional, I said, well, I'm not Colombian, you know, we're not a monolith. I am a bicultural uh, uh, product of a Puerto Rican mother and a Scotch Irish Texan father. I got into this work, uh, I will call it cultural entrepreneurship because I was really curious about exploring identity. I was curious about getting away from culture as this, this theme, culture as entertainment or amusement. And I was really interested in converting that conversation and that entertainment, that, that perspective into a, a, a theme, a conversation about identity and cultural rights. And most of my work over the past 20, 25 years has been about that. And it's been about applying working in three dimensions, whether it's Mexico, whether it's Puerto Rico, um, whether it's, you know, when, when I was in Washington, DC, three dimensions, personal, relational, and contextual. I was always in Mexico, this has been very important because there's so many projects, cultural entertainment projects, not, not about necessarily beyond the university uh, cultural centers and contexts about collaborations with master artists or commissioning of new work by performance creators across disciplines. Um, I wanted to be involved to do more of this work from what I had been doing in Washington to translate that to Mexico. So, and, and to learn, you know, because we're talking about, you know, I really wanted to learn about the artists who are working in the canon of contemporary art and how presenters or how cultural workers in Mexico were curating and putting context and dealing with the massive historical migrations and the immigration issues and, and the symbiotic good and bad relationship between the United States and Mexico. I mean, we are, estamos en la cama juntos. That's a little saying there in Espanol. We are in bed together. We're working together because that is what it, 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 we are interconnected. So I really wanted to dedicate a lot of 
my work in Mexico to building a cultural corridor between, you know, my colleagues in the United States and Mexico, you know, what I was doing to really understand what was going on with performance, with the new work, with, um, with ultimately how I could help support the work of artists in distribution and experiencing work in, as Baraka well said, debunking myths, dismantling the fervent stereotypes that are still um, vibrant in the United States on Mexico, you know, and we are, and Mexico is really in every aspect of, of everybody's life from the food in the US to everything. It's, it's symbiote, it's ingrained. So I get to Mexico and, you know, I was really interested in learning about, you, you know, um, addressing communal needs and that creative placemaking and how to enhance the quality of life and build communities, enrich communities in that experience. And I found that in Mexico, our creativity really represented, represents a mix of like local ingenuity and effervescence, a cosmopolitan flair, a whole plethora, just a, thousands of just incredibly, incredible community initiated projects dealing with issues of social justice human rights and equity combined you know combining your work with a really sophisticated digital presence to project work around the world animation you know i saw i was learning over the past you know years i've seen in mexico that festivals and cultural spaces in mexico and i would say the same for puerto rico but i'll get to that in a moment work with really few resources I mean, they receive, there's government support, there's some adventurous backing from a few company and philanthropists, but the artist run independent spaces are vital to that ecosystem in Mexico and, and, the, and the creative work. Um, so I think like for one example that I would say from, from Mexico and, and really getting involved in seeing the deep roots that we have indigenous. I mean, I gotta say it, you know, we are, we're home to over 6 million indigenous language speakers. Um, there, we are, there are 68 indigenous recognized languages, but there are hundreds more that are dying out, you know, beyond Maya or Nahuatl, hundreds more that are dying out. The work has to be there as well. You know, really we have to, we have to focus right now on, on, on what we're doing with our diversity in Mexico, how we're supporting the independent spaces. And I remember a, a just a really great moment in my experience in Mexico and one of the Day of the Dead parades where, you know, we got the gig to do the, the Day of the Dead parade because of the movie Spectre and James Bond and because they used they filmed a, a small part of, you know, they a, a small part of the, the our main plaza, the Zocalo, for their movie, using the Day of the Dead traditioning and launching it as as if it was this new thing, you know, this great cosmo, this this big production. And frankly, the Day of the Dead in Mexico has been on, has been occurring. It's a right from 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 pre-Hispanic times, from going into the inframundo, from cross. I mean, it's got all this all of our lore tradition are, you know, we basically eat our death in a bizarre way, a ironic touch on death with skulls and what, with, the, with the breads that we make that are made for that time. And the Day of the Dead Parade, they gave us the chance to not do a Disney World type of parade or something. They really gave us a chance to study, to go through the regions, to go through the customs from different regions, from different epochas and eras like the revolution or um, Posada, all of the engravings of those very famous calacas, the, the skulls and the skeletons that are now all over. And a million people were out on that street in Reforma, pushing together from all walks of life. It was the biggest, most important expression of art in public space at a time when Mexico was going through the 43 dead, the hundreds, the corruption, the, the, the dead bodies, not the, the, the bodies of children and families not being able to be found in unknown graves. I mean, it was a time and it still is of, of, of violence, of, of, of corruption, of political and social strife and uncertainty that we've always been living with, that Mexico's always been living with. And yet here we were with this incredible display of in an honest, uh, an honest, sensitive way of what these traditions launched to the world of, of the Day of the Dead, which is actually a UNESCO 
um, world heritage uh, patrimony. So, you know, I, I think that for me, working in Mexico and seeing those connection and, and, and really being able to link artists from Mexico with my presenter colleagues in the US. I mean, at that time, a lot of us were looking in the US, what can we do? What's being done in Mexico, Latin America, and the Caribbean? We want to bring we want to bring Latino artists, but you know you have to think about how you you bringing Latino artists. You have to bring the work, not the stereotype. Not you have to bring the vision. There's so much contemporary work being done that is impressive. So I don't know how much time I have left. Um, I think I don't have any more time left. I, I think you're right on right on time, Christina. Okay, so right well, I think we'll just probably leave it with Mexico. I'll, all I can say really, and I really did want to talk about Puerto Rico because Puerto Rico is pretty much, you know, known for, yeah, the music, the lush tropical forests, the breathtaking skies, and they're all well documented, but our history is nurtured by 500 years of a melting pot and counting of multicultural influence of, of heritage in addition to our colonial status. And that colonial status is something that needs to be addressed in a, in a place, in a country now where 57% of our children live in poverty in 2019. We're a US territory. We have nothing to do with uh, estadio, estado asociado libre, a free, a free territory. So I wanna put out that we have a vibrant cultural scene. I'm working right now on a project called Transformarte where we're bringing together the methodology of the theater of the oppressed by Augusto Boal. And we're bringing it, uh, we're working with community leaders in eight uh, communities throughout the, uh, throughout the island to bring together theater and community organization and developing community leaders through theater and having them see their their solve their their scenes themselves on stage so creativity thank you christina and thank you so much this was so wonderful i want to remind uh, everyone that you can put your questions in the facebook chat with howl around or the facebook chat at asu gamage and also, I just want to take an opportunity for those of you who weren't with us at the top of the hour, that this conversation came as a result of a number of individuals involved with presenting international artists, global artists, and wondering where we are today in this country, dealing with COVID, dealing with US policies, dealing with systemic racism, dealing with things that make us seem more insular. And so the concern is that we look forward and we look outside of the US for this discussion. Also, as I said earlier, we will have other discussions with our global partners and with artists. Right now, it's my pleasure to introduce Joe Melillo. And Joe, you will start with your focus on Europe. And I wanna thank everyone for trying to be mindful of our eight minute time limit. Thank you. Okay, so um, what I want to contextualize is that my presentation comes out of an urban performing arts center. The urbanness is defined by a place called New York City. So um, the prof but I want to address my job as a performing arts presenter was to be the person who is responsible for making a judgment, making a choice. So what does that mean? It means that I am for my community as complicated as New York City is. And for my institution, I was making a decision as to which artist or art, artist company was going to be represented within the artistic structure of my institution. So let's parse what I'm saying. My job is to service. I'm servicing my institution. That's where the paycheck came from. My other job was to service my community and in a place like New York City, it's plural, it's communities that I am servicing. So not only am I servicing them with art and culture, I'm also advancing 
their understanding of art and culture within a contemporary context. So, I mean, that is the reality of an urban identity that we honor with great reverence, traditions. Remember, it's a performing arts center. So it's, there are multiple traditions that are held in the diaspora of the citizens of New York City and in the country of origin, the tradition is a living tradition and there is a relationship between our endeavor in servicing our communities of ethnicity or racial identity with the intrinsic life of a tradition that's being held in their communities. So that could be Africa, Asia, that it can be in Eastern Europe and, and as much as my responsibility in this presentation to talk, to talk about the European community. So I mean, this is what fundamentally is operating when you have the job. We had jobs in order to do this assignment to program and service our institution and my uh, identity as the Brooklyn Academy of Music or BAM as it's affectionately known. And that's what my endeavor was about. So because I didn't create the institution, I stand on the shoulders of another man 20 years older than me, who actually made the institution a profound part of the cultural and artistic life of New York City, and that's Harvey Lichtenstein. And so when I entered the game, he hired me in 1983, was to create a contemporary performing arts festival. And I'm here to say to anyone who's watching this, that the performing arts is not a static art. It's an ever growing, organically evolving art. So there is a contemporary artistic reservoir and simultaneously there's a traditional reservoir when you're speaking about global artists. I think we have got to change our language and use global and not international because we still are living with an a age disparity where an older generation than us thinks of internationalism solely about the European community. No, my interest is a global understanding. We're one planet, we're very complicated in terms of our muscle, multiplicity of our identities. And so I think we're better serviced by saying global uh, rather than international. That's a different matter. But I want to be able to, as what the charge was, to say, you know, when I talk about being someone who's responsible for servicing my communities, one of the most important communities that I, in my lexicon of definition of communities, plural, is the artistic communities of the five boroughs of New York City. And we happen to be one of the great cities that has been responsive to the art form of dance. And so it took a, the Brooklyn Academy Music Band to introduce a German artist who fashioned in the 20th century a new art form in the realm of the genre of dance. She created a hybrid in German, Tanz theater, in English, dance theater. But in 1984, 
Bam presented and introduced to New York City the work of Pina Bausch, Tanz Theater Wuppertal, Germany. No one had ever in this country seen the live work of this artist. And she created, crafted a hybrid art form of great validity that was being toured throughout the European community. And what the presentation of Pina Bausch at BAM Hamlet created was a extraordinary major change in the understanding of the possibility of an art form called dance that the American artistic community needed to see that it was possible to do something other and be extraordinarily successful. She is a German citizen, not an American. We, an American arts presenting organization, took on the responsibility of introducing her to the dance capital of the United States, New York City. That's what we're talking about. Art in front of people. Part of those people are artists and artists need this inspiration. And a great artist named Pina Bausch made it possible for them to absolutely extraordinarily consider the possibilities of their own art. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. That was extraordinary. Thank you so much. And now next up, Olga Garay English. Well, Olga will not only focus on Latin America and the Caribbean, but Olga has been an important funder in making international work possible. Olga? Hello, everybody. Um, thank you so much for inviting me to be here with you all today. I think that amongst the people who are uh, presenting as well as the responders and the uh, people who are gonna be asking questions, we have well over, well over a hundred years of shared history. I mean, we have been in the trenches for so many, many years. And so it's particularly um, meaningful for me to be part of this conversation. Um, I will say that um, two things. One is I was born in Cuba uh, and uh, have been in this country since 1961. So I think that part of my um, allegiance to understanding of passion for um, creating international cultural engagement uh, which I think goes beyond just touring the performing arts, but it really is about an engagement activity, um, comes from a very deep-seated uh, side of me. Um, I have been a presenter and I have uh, collaborated with, with uh, many of the folks who are on this uh, panel. Um, but I think that unlike most of the folks on, on this panel, I, I have been a funder, as Colleen said. And I think that um, I will dedicate most of my thoughts and, and comments to that side of the equation. Um, when I started being a presenter in Miami uh, at Miami Dade College, we were, you know, Miami Dade College back then it was Miami-Dade Community College. It's a, it's a very large, it's probably the largest community college um, in the country. Extremely diverse, but extremely made up of uh, working class people who are just there to get, you know, a, a license that will maybe increase their wages a little bit. Uh, it is not a, an Ivy League school by any stretch of the imagination. However, we were uh, able to create uh, a, a, a whole cultural affairs department that challenged uh, itself to present, produce, and exhibit the best and most compelling contemporary 
uh, performing and visual arts being created in this country and abroad with a particular emphasis on Latin America and the Caribbean because of obviously the, the uh, population of Miami. I say all of this because it really um, fed my work as a presenter. I was uh, very privileged, and you will hear from David White later to this evening, uh, to become engaged with the National Performance Network very early uh, in its, in its uh, beginnings. And it completely changed the way that I thought about art. It was, you know, Miami back then is not the Miami we know now. It was still um, privileging what we used to call the SOBs, the symphony um, orchestras and ballets, um, and, and not paying attention to um, the work that was being created by our extremely diverse communities. And that uh, ability to learn about the National Performance Network and learn about contemporary art and learn about the, the connectivity between places of origin and being able to speak to audience members who perhaps had not had the privilege of being uh, exposed to the arts before really um, just was such a learning curve for me uh, as I became a funder first at the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation, where I was the founding director uh, of the, perfor the performing arts program, and later here in Los Angeles as the executive director of the City of Los Angeles Department of Cultural Affairs. And the reason that I want to emphasize the, my role as the funder is because the the difference from the the philanthropic um, the philanthropic universe that used to be in place when I was at Miami Dade in terms of funding and encouraging international or global cultural exchange has diminished so much that I really just want to call that out. When I was at Miami Dade, we got funding support from the Rockefeller Foundation, from the Ford Foundation, from the Pew Charitable Trust, from the Wallace Fund, all of these national organizations that provided vital philanthropic support. Um, they didn't just fund uh, us to do national work. They funded us to do work. They funded us to do work that made sense in our communities. And in the case of Miami, as in the case of New York, where I later moved, and in the case of Los Angeles, where I am now, internationalism and global perspectives are so baked into our DNA that I think that I would like to use my, my time here talking to you to set out a plea for both the, the, the public and the private sector uh, in terms of philanthropy to rethink why we're not encouraging that type of work anymore. Now that we have a new administration that is ready to take, take back our seat at a global table, at a global conversation and everything from nuclear armaments to you know, reduction of the pandemic um, the arts need to have that same kind of um, forum and uh, relevancy because we are really part of what's going to make not only our own country, the United States of America, but the world as a whole, a better place, a more just place, a more equitable place. And the arts have a major, major role to play in that. So thank you so much for inviting me tonight and I look forward to our discussion. Thank you, Olga. And I underscore what you have just said, so important. Next we have with us, Philip Arnaud. Philip will be speaking about his work in Eastern Europe. Am I there? Yes, yes. All right. This is not an easy task. 
um, particularly for me, because about eight years ago, I had open heart surgery and in a incredible a hallucination as I was dying and people were just walking away from me, I pulled out my breathing tube. So I'm talking to you all with one vocal cord that doesn't like the late day time, but let me try this. The value proposition, it's always been about the work uh, to me. Uh, what I founded the theater project in 1971. I had a black box theater, flexible, small, 150 folks. But I also had a resident company that first year, uh, the Otrabanda Company, uh, Americans for sure. Later on, went to make all sorts of different history. But with me, they started right after they had spent a year with the Belgian Flemish director, Tone Berlin. Uh, and Tone was spoken in the 60s, in the same set in the 70s, in the same breath as Grotowski. And he hammered together this really extraordinary company. It was, I started the theater as a free theater. Uh, early on, I presented along with the resident companies, uh, downtown theater from New York. Uh, and a large uh, artist audience, when Joe talked about that artistic community, that's where I heard about every new turn BAM was taking, not from anything they sent me, but from artist in New York who said, look what's coming. Anyhow, so that's where it all began in 1971. In 73, I got to see the work after reading a lot about it, uh, the, the work of Grotowski uh, in Philadelphia. My friend Richard Menon brought Grotowski there. He'd left the theater, but he was still performing Ap uh, Apocalypsis Cum Figuris. I saw it twice in Philadelphia. Uh, once when um, Richard and I, Richard gave me the whole house and we invited about 50 artists and presenters. One man drove from North Dakota to come see this one performance uh, of Apocalypsis. In 74, the Grotowski analogy the Iowa Theater Lab that was making a lot of noise in this country and abroad uh, left Iowa City and became my second uh, uh, resident company. Uh, Rick Sank's company, uh, as I said, was in residence teaching, creating. When I got a call from Tony Abison who was then the director of a lab company in Washington, Washington Theater Lab, saying he was traveling secretly in the country with Grotowski, trying to find a partner for a project called the Pillar of Flame. And they were finishing up and they wanted to come see me. Thought I might be the partner. And uh, sure enough, Grotowski came unknown to anybody and spent three days of meetings, I agreed to move forward with this incredible project that I could take the rest of the night talking about. Uh, but Grotowski also saw the lab, uh, lab's production of Dancer Without Arms. There's a three hour meeting in my office with Grotowski that again, I'd love to share with you but we don't have the time. In 76, Grotowski invited me to Poland and this was my first visit uh, to Eastern Europe. I'm sorry, it was 75. So I'm now <clears throat> looking at um, 46 years ago. <clears throat> 
the Iowa Theater Lab had a strong connection then with the International Theater Institute. And that's when I hooked up with the uh, ITI and Martha Kwanye, who really became my mentor for the rest of my, her life. And I traveled a lot looking at this work that was, <coughs> excuse me, stunning to me, that was increasing my understanding of what theater could be. And I found it traveling about a, <coughs> excuse me, a hundred days a year while I was still running the theater project. And then when I left the theater project and started CITD, it was about 200 days a year, not just in, <clears throat> excuse me, Eastern Europe, uh, but all over. And I kept going back, looking at new work to bring to that quirky audience. So <clears throat> it all was rooted in the work and rooted in those unbelievable relationships that I was so honored to have with the people that made that work. The one story, I'll try to do this real quickly, November 2018, I was probably then making my 100th visit to Hungary and a lot was happening in this country. We were all uh, looking at this tectonic change of artist leadership. I've got the one minute warning and I'm going to land it. But also I was, so I was excited about that, but deeply concerned about where I'd seen Hungary go. And the right wing Orban government was uh, taking over. He was, and the week that I was there, along with Howard Shalowitz later and uh, Margaret Lawrence, the uh, Central European University was kicked out. And it was there where the notion of trying to seed relationships that could last 20 years, 30 years. I'd just come from lunch in four days with four people who, <coughs> I had more than a hundred years of history with. So we've, now I'm staring 80 down next month and I'm still working and launching two projects, one in Hungary and one in Poland, four years linking new leadership in this country and abroad. And I'm glad to be sitting here talking to you all. Thank you, Philip. And we're honored that you're sitting here talking with us. Next. It's my pleasure to introduce Rachel Cooper, who will talk to us about Asia. Big topic, Rachel. I can't possibly talk about all of Asia, but uh, we are in this together. We live together. We are live together, whether we're in the room or we're in the Zoom. And how we engage not only to hear, but to really listen is really, I think, the work that we are all engaged in. Today, two thirds of the global population live in Asia, with China and India, of course, counting for the largest proportion, and the world's fourth most populous nation being Indonesia. By the turn of the next century, 90% of the people on this planet are expected to live outside Europe and North America. So we often say the arts are transformative and create empathy and discovery and expansiveness, but what do we really mean and how does that really connect us in ways that, that our governments really can't? And that I think is so important. The world has changed during this global pandemic and it underscores our interdependence. And I think as Joe said earlier about being global, uh, it is also about being a part of a, a, a larger whole. So I would say it is not a local versus international choice that is sometimes thrown out to us in the arts. It's a false equivalency to say that. It's not an either or, it's how are we together in this world, both global and local at the same time. America first, a former president said, 
not seeing that the air, the water, the planet are in an interdependent relationship and that it is our shared humanity that we've got to bring together. Asia has been part of the American performing arts and the, just the fabric of our, our community for at least 150 years, whether in the formal or informal sector. So Cantonese opera, for example, came 150 years ago during the time of the Transcontinental Railroad or the vibrant Filipino jazz musicians in New Orleans, also in the 19th century or the incredible Arab musicians that were in New York in the 1930s. And, and there are so many other artists that we could talk about, many of, of whom have been presented by many of you, whether that's contemporary, popular, traditional, some hybrid mix. But I wanted to share three experiences from my time at the Asia Society, where I have been really honored to work with some incredible artists and to be um, a cog in the ecology. I don't know if you have cogs in ecology. That's definitely a mixed metaphor. Uh, first, I want to talk about Iran. So Sharam Nazari and the path of Rumi. So I'm, I'm picking specifically some countries where I think uh, I'm generalizing, but many Americans do not understand and don't think art first when they think about Iran. And Sharam Nazari was, uh, a profoundly uh, powerful musician uh, and brought the path of Rumi. Uh, and again, as many of us would say, this was part of a 20 year relationship because I believe that we in the arts uh, are really about process and relationship and not just transaction. I know there's a market out there, but really so many of us have long-term relationships and those interactions are really important. So the second one I wanted to talk about was Pakistan's Abda Parveen. Abda Parveen uh, is an incredible Sufi superstar in South Asia. And after the Times Square uh, bombing attempt, the ambassador, Hassan Hussein, decided that the best way to try to reach Americans and change their view of Pakistan wasn't a uh, diatribe at the UN, but to bring their greatest artists. And he brought Abda Parveen and she performed at Union Square where we got 5,000 people. But one of the moments that was really touching was when a audience member wrote to me about three months after this performance and said, I just heard about a flood in Pakistan and I've contributed. And I wanted you to know the reason I contributed was because I saw that concert. And Pakistan was no longer the place where there were bombings. Pakistan was the home of this incredible artist and therefore I had, he felt he had a connection. And finally, I wanted to say something about Myanmar, uh, Burma, uh, particularly right now. Uh, Asia Society has had a connection with artists from Burma and I'm using the word Burma right now uh, as a decision. Uh, starting in 1976, and they brought very traditional artists and they toured them all over the US and had all the contextual materials. And in fact, that's where I first saw them when I was a student at UCLA in the World Arts and Cultures Program. But then in 2003, I wanted to bring a group because I had really fallen in love with this art form and these people and had had started a relationship. So um, I tried to bring a group. It, it took uh, several attempts because that was the time of a military regime. And, uh, and even the Minister of Culture said, I'm not sure we believe in cultural exchange. But I was encouraged to keep going and keep trying. And we brought this extraordinary group. That was in 2003. 2015, we brought another group, a Zatwe. By that time, the country had opened up. It was a whole different feeling. There was a sense of not only, uh, not only the traditional culture, but the pop culture. There was heavy metal. There was hip hop. And now, at this moment, we're in a very different and very sad and upsetting time. And 
of course, because as I said, we're all about relationships. Those of us working in this area, we have relationships. These are the lifetime relationships. And, and therefore, the artists that I'm hearing from are hip hop artists, because of course, this is not a one way street. We're talking about arts that go back and forth and part of a, a larger ecology in which American artists are also often seen there. And then it's the hip hop artists who are creating the work about this horrific coup that is taking place and the violence that's going on right now. But what I, I wanted to emphasize is that it's, it's the artists who have the voice who are bringing this to a global audience. And if we're gonna keep this on the radar beyond the uh, you know CNN saying, well, that was last week. I think it's gonna be from artists. And I think it's that, that passion. And, and so um, I, I feel very honored to be a part of this group and to be able to, to share just a, a little bit. And I've put some, um, some links in to the, uh, that will be shared on HowlRound later. But thank you very much. Thank you so much, Rachel. And you're right, there's so much to talk about. Thank you for bringing the, those things to light and there's much more to come to light. Now it is time for our responders. And again, we have chosen four responders who have long histories in terms of international and global presenting. And we're going to begin with Claudia Norman. Claudia. Hola, gracias a todos. Um, uh, thank you, Colleen, and thank you everyone for, for these amazing uh, stories. Um, and, and, and as we revisit in the history of performing arts, I mean, with the panelists, um, I would like us to, to travel to the time and travel to the future and to remember this moment as the time when the pandemic has shown us how interconnected we are, but also the time when we saw again that migration, colonization, slavery, displacement, as Baraka and Christina had mentioned, has been part of a human history, but part of our common present. I want us to remember this as the time of Renaissance, when we had the chance to establish collaborations, quote unquote, between artist communities, independent producers, cultural organizations, foundations, as Philip Ward had shown us. And when instead of negotiations, when we wanted to establish conversations and non-negotiations, when we were talking about reciprocity locally and globally like Rachel and Olga have mentioned. I want the future generations to look at this day today as the day when a group of global citizens as Joe has mentioned, were in the middle of a cultural quest and working very hard to finding better practices to keep connected and to keep our relationships, long-term relationship with the rest of the world. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia. Dos gracias. And now next with us will be John Kalaki, the Honorable Representative from the great state of Vermont. Hello, what an honor to be here with all of you. And you know, I, this group gathered today, Colleen, is my Kula, my intentional community. Uh, we, we, we learned together for decades. I remember meeting Joe Malillo in 1983 when he first went to BAM. I was at Trisha Brown. And after that performance, I put press kits in a backpack and got a URL pass and went over to Europe because there, there wasn't even email then. And we just I just knocked on doors opening up uh, Trisha's uh, European market because we didn't know how to do it. We just helped each other. So Art Picasso, Fee from Merce Cunningham, gave me a list of presenters. I used that, you know, and then um, David White, who are you going to hear from with the National Performance Network, really made it a priority for us to be a community, to learn from each other, 
to kind of argue with each other, challenge each other, support each other, and also really travel together. This group, we've, we've traveled all over the world together. And as important, I've seen work by artists in their communities. We also were able to be together, having dinners with artists, having drinks with artists, going to bars with artists, having a good time and understanding this context. I loved what Christina said about the personal, relational, and contextual, because we really did that. As many of you, we taught all over the world as well. And sometimes our marketing and fundraising ideas didn't really translate very well. And we learned more from the artists in Eastern Europe and other places that we had the opportunity to teach together. So I think that's really something that before there wasn't very much, we kind of built it, we made mistakes together, we grew it, it became professionalized. And now that it's collapsed again in this implosion, I think it's important for us to realize that it's again about artists. And uh, Arvo Park, who a uh, wonderful composer that I love, he uh, said something that says, this tiny coronavirus has shown us in a painful way that humanity is a single organism and that human existence is possible only in relation to other living beings. So we have to open up we have to get the funders again. Olga, thank you for that, because we, it really was capitalized. These curatorial trips are research intensive. Our own government, federal government put in money, other foreign governments put in money. We have to really change this thing to welcome people, um, not, not have the, the tyranny of the last four years. So I'm, I'm really hoping that in the new administration that there's gonna be open borders. And I cannot wait for the next decade of working with all of you on these issues. And, I feel ble very blessed to be among my Kula. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. That was beautiful. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Linda Brumbach. Linda? Hi, Colleen. Thank you so much. And it's so amazing to be here with all of you and, um, and John Kalaki to speak after John, who actually taught me to ask artists how to dream. And I learned so much from him over the years. Um, I just want to um, uh, acknowledge, and I'm looking down on notes as all, everyone was speaking, I took some notes and I'm just so inspired and continue to be inspired by this group. Um, there are some, some women in the field that, um, that are my heroes who actually think so much about the connective tissue of the artists. And as we bring international artists and, 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 uh, and the global community to America and outward, um, into other countries and support American artists. Um, women like Lisa Booth and Deirdre Valente and Anne Rosenthal and Kathy Zimmerman who have spent their lives really thinking about how these artists move from region to region, uh, institution to institution and, um, and care for them. And I'm not really just you know, talking about the travel and the visas and the freight and the obvious methods that it takes to support international work, but really, um, unpacking and understanding and researching and deepening the understanding of different methodologies and ways of, of the way we work in our structures in America when we invite and bring artists to our country and want to support them to come to America and really think about what America is and the different regions and perspectives that we have when we are inviting artists from abroad to come here. Um, it's really impossible for me not to think about um, what Baraka said. Um, I think about artists as global artists, all artists as international artists and thinking about international um, presenting on our care of um, how we bring artists and invite them to our country, as well as how we support artists, um, American artists who desire and, and really want to um, have an opportunity to share their voice and their craft abroad. So that's a constant circle and thought for me. Um, there are so many uh, topics that came up with our speakers and I just um, wanna, wanna uh, focus on a few of them, Baraka, you mentioned um, also, you know, how things were. And I often think about the idea of flexibility and every opportunity we have to work with an artist from the first time they come to America 
um, and how we structure things in America are very different from other countries and our openness and heart and mind to be flexible um, and to work with them within their structures. And this is goes back to, you know, uh, memories of bringing um, Virginia Rodriguez from Bahia, Brazil here for the first time and Zvukimu from Russia at a time when things were changing in their country. There were very um, vulnerable issues to share their voices here in America and that care and understanding of how they needed to work here was very important for those communities. So I wanna um, acknowledge that and thank you Baraka for bringing that up. Um, Christina, you, um, you spoke so beautifully, and I, I know the work you do is so deep in the community, uh, the communities that you work in. And one of the, the points that really resonated with me um, was the depth um, and how we reach and understand the communities and not just coming in and out. And you do that so well. And I just want to amplify that whenever we have an, a, a, a way to support that structure, um, it is, uh, extremely valuable. I had the opportunity this summer to go to the Grec Festival in Barcelona and look at some work there. And there were many presenters there, but what was interesting and incredible about the experience was that we were given the opportunity to visit artists working in their own spaces in different mediums outside of the city and really have time to learn about their craft, learn about their work, eat with them, have time with them and have deep, a deeper understanding. So I just wanna um, acknowledge that and thank you, Christina. Joe, um, I think my time might be up. Nope. Go ahead. Go <laughs> ahead with that thought. Please. I just want to. I, I had something to say about everyone's. Comment, well, then please go right. Ahead. Go right ahead. I'm going to end up. I, you know, I'll stop with Joe. But I just, you know, Joe, you were talking about the care, um, the care and the responsibility. And one thing I just want to mention when this topic came up is, is, um, you know, there was also a lot of work that that was happening with the State Department and the cultural diplomacy. And 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 you know, I just want to bring up you know, the, the program Dance Motion USA and the impact that it had for American artists to really educate on a mass level. And, and, you know, as we have this conversation, as we think about this conversation together going forward, there is so much to learn from the intrinsic value and change that those programs um, had on an impactful level for American artists and from artists abroad. And I just hope that we can really look and, and start this conversation with um, some of the impact that Olga had and Rachel. And, and this is just a beginning because it's just um, very important work for the healing of America. And as we are reckoning with our own divide, I think there's nothing more essential than investing in that um, place of innovation. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. That was beautiful. Thank you so much. It's now time for David White to wrap up the responders. David. David, uh, unmute yourself, please. Okay, rarely do people ask me to unmute myself, but uh, here I am. Uh, I just wanted to speak a little bit to, uh, I, I've learned so much and have loved so deeply the people, many of the people in this room and, um, and hope to continue to do so in the future. Um, but I also wanted to talk a little bit, at least from my point of view, which had to do with a lot of the buildup of international work came from individual artists who um, wanted to um, explore elements of their heritages that were the international or global uh, flip, flip of the coin from um, their own heritages, immigration expenses, you know, experiences, et cetera. And that was something that began back in the mid eighties uh, and during the time of identity politics. I mean, that we're seeing echoes, if not a huge, you know, timpani of them now. And um, so being able to make sure that people had money immediately that they could essentially ATM the suitcase fund 
and um, pursue some of this curiosity, some of this intrinsic interest, some of this just trying to get to know who they were and blend it back into the work that they were doing. Um, one of the things that has become clear over time, and I have to thank here everybody at the Rockefeller Foundation, uh, Suzanne Sato and uh, Alberta Arthurs and uh, Thomas Ibarra Fausto and, um, uh, oh well, there were others, uh, Steve Levine, um, for putting money into a pot uh, for which they would never know the outcomes. This was similar to the NPN. No one knew what the outcome would be of funding these various artists getting into place and get being supported. And so in terms of um, international work, artists began to really want to, I mean, we supported also Ron Brown going to the Ivory Coast. We supported um, Reggie Wilson going to um, uh, Zimbabwe, um, working in a school there at Harare, and, um, and so, many, so many more kinds of things. And one of the things we realized was that we needed to keep supporting things so that the, the work would have a lasting component. I, I often said that we go when, uh, in the kind of work we do, we, um, we create an event, we present an event, okay. Uh, but then there's, if we bring something back again and do it deeper, there becomes this kind of familiarity that's something that was missing with the event. And then finally bring them back again. And then you have this kind of solid relationship in the community. And I'll just say that that has happened in the last, Five years, we presented uh, Mel Paso from Cuba four times. Um, we presented uh, Le Patin Libre, the rogue ice skaters from Quebec, um, you know, three out of four years. And what, the next one was just canceled because of COVID. Uh, but all of this was a sign of the kind of work that we wanted to do to make sure that artists were remembered, that they could dig in and that they could find communities uh, both at home, but certainly away from home. Um, and, and in which they would also identify with other working artists. So I just wanted to bring those two things up. And then finally, just to say that um, besides those long-term structures, the idea of creating long-term structures of support. I mean, in a way, I think I, I often saw myself as a feral systems des designer. I didn't know what I was doing, but it seemed to have a systemic um, part to it. And so like with the NPN and seeing how these kind of individual activities morphed into, as John Kalaki alluded to, you know, a community of, uh, of, of not necessarily always like-minded, but sort of likely like-purposed uh, individual. And then that began when the suitcase fund began shortly thereafter, even though it wasn't meant to be modeled on that, it turned out to be uh, a way of building that idea of community into this larger framework of inviting work, of getting to um, build relationships with international producers, et cetera. Thank you. Thank you, David. You know, for the panelists you've heard from, the responders you've heard from, there is such a deep conversation that thank you HowlRound and IPC that we're going to need to explore this further because there's such richness from lessons we've learned and lessons we are still yet to learn. I wanna ask for our first question to come from Mark Murphy. And Mark, we know of your international work, both at On the Boards and Red Cat. Could you ask your first question of the panelists, please? And of our responders. And if yes. we could maybe have all of us on the screen, Althea. Thank you, Colleen. I'm inspired by this panel, and uh, I'm having flashbacks to memories of times when working with so many of you to uh, invent a way of working internationally in the U.S. There was no one who taught it to us, and all of you taught it to me and uh, invented ways to make it work. Uh, that leads to how that uh, uh, quasi-infrastructure uh, gets passed on. Uh, most of the memorable moments and the worst war stories from the international presenting 
were uh, presenters functioning as managers and agents, dividing up the responsibilities to make a tour happen because it was not a profitable uh, venture for uh, management, especially with artists from Latin America and from Asia, uh, which uh, were even more complicated in terms of the logistics. Uh, is, there, uh, is there expertise there to re-emerge, especially post-COVID and post-Trump? Uh, and what can we do to make that, that possible? Because there are many agents I know of uh, and uh, managers who uh, are risk averse uh, at this moment, especially when it comes to international work and especially non-European work. Linda, do you want to start with that? Yes, I mean, I think that we have to build variables in together, um, whether, you know, artists are working with um, managers, agents, creative producers um, to plan. I think, you know, we're doing that right now, Mark, with American artists traveling abroad of really in this time building in um, when we've gone through this after 9-11, where so many tours were planned and then canceled because artists couldn't get their visas. We had a situation with some artists coming in from Pakistan. Um, I think transparency at this moment is essential and collaboration in terms of variables. And we need to make sure we're, we're protecting the artists, but not only the lead artist, the, the infrastructure of people that support and hold the art that are part of that company are need to be thought of in terms of that planning and risk factor. So I think we do need to do it together. And, and, my, and it's happening right now in many different countries. Um, new rules and regulations are coming through. And I think as we think about presenting, we're thinking about it as engagements of the phases it takes and the year long planning to actually commit to presenting international work and what that means if something goes wrong. Claudia? Yeah, I, I think um, when I was talking about reciprocity, um, it's, it's, it's basically when you are, you, you are committed to present international work, uh, you have to be committed to have, a, to establish long-term relationships. And also you have to, uh, like um, Baraka says, you have to research, you have to study, uh, and then you enter into a room, into a conversation, not a negotiation. You enter into a conversation and you build and you listen and you learn what are the needs or you, their needs, uh, the artists coming to the US and, and what are your needs to present that artist. And that is like, do you really need translation? Do you need, really need, uh, can, 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 can something coming from Latin America can be spoken in Spanish? And Spanish is almost a universal language in the US or in some areas in the US. Do you really need translation? Is really that something that is going to not give you the chance to present that work? So I think it has to do with um, going beyond just the surface, you know, and, and, and requires like a, a full commitment. I think you froze up a little on us, Claudia. Yeah. So, and, and when, when you talk, when, <laughs> when you talk about the roles that we play, I think this is the time when I talk about Renaissance is, is the time to rethink our roles. And we all have to be involved at the same level. So we all have to have a certain uh, participation in, in, in translating, uh, in, uh, in doing, as I call myself, cultural translator. It's not about uh, terminology. Um, it's, it's, it's about what really needs to be understood and, and see that as a part of a community, not the other, but is part of your community and how you welcome in that community. So those cultural nuances are gonna give you the chance to successfully reach out to your local communities 
but also is going you're going to give the artist to really have an ev uh, and have your final evaluation and it's not about quantity but about quality of that cultural experience so that's thank you claudia well said i'm going to ask mark russell who just presented us with under the radar virtually to ask the next question, Mark. And you can unmute and unvisualize yourself, I guess, or revisualize yourself. You have the question on the chat. Abigail, can you read the question? Sure, yes, there's Thank two you. questions in the chat. Um, Mark says, uh, such a necessary and powerful conversation. Thank you to everyone on the panel and for those responding. I am interested in what each of the panelists feels about the future. Where do we go now? What does a US fresh cultural policy look like? For instance, would you want a cabinet level culture czar? And, and we have a total of four minutes, so Joe, Go for it. Uh, listen, in an ideal world, uh, I believe it would be possible with a democratic president and, and uh, that it would be possible to engage them in a conversation about having a minister of culture, a secretary of culture in a cabinet position. I think the conversation could be had, okay? That's the positive side, all right? The other side of this is you have to recognize that we, you know, the United States of America are 50 United States that agreed to be collectively under that rubric. And each state, is this is through states rights versus federal, and you know, we as cultural producers, presenters, we are not recognized within many cities, not even the state of having agency responsibility. So I, I actually think it's, it's important that this happens sometime in the future. There's a lot of work to be able to make that happen. That's all. All right, thank you, Joan. I think it was very well said. We believe it or not, at, or at the end of this session, and this session could have gone on for another hour or more. It's uh, my distinct honor to thank our panelists, our responders, those of you who've answered questions, those of you who are continuing to do the work, those of you who are just beginning to do the work, this is the beginning of a conversation that we will have again and again. I want to thank the International Presenting Commons. I want to thank the work done by Jamie, Abigail, and Thea with HowlRound. David Dow, I want to thank you for jump-starting us in this conversation. So important. Christy Edmonds, I always hear your voice in my head, so shout out to you and to everyone. Again, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Colleen. <laughs>